<laughs> Me? Yes, whatever you say, yes. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's city council meeting. Tonight is an in-depth meeting, which means we dispense with some of the formalities and have a lot of discussion and learning about things. Fran, will you please do the roll call? Councilmember Raywalt. Present. Fitzgerald. Natfig. Present. Saucedo. Present. Bynum. Present. Harvey. Present. Spread. Present. Six present and one absent, Your Honor. Thank you, Fran. Thanks, everyone, for coming tonight. We're going to move right on into the agenda. And first up, we have Nancy from Alliant Energy is going to give us a brief. I don't see, Nancy. I don't see her, though. Yeah. OK. We will oh, move you on. Know why? Why? <laughs> because it's November the 9th. Oh, well, that would be a good reason. <laughs> it's all right, Fran. <laughs> we'll move to number three and get us closer to Jerry's Cubs game. <laughs> The third thing is Nancy is going to talk to us about our year-end presentation. Taller mic tonight. Yes, it is. I don't have to lean. Uh, tonight we're going to be reviewing the budget basis financial statements and this will be a, similar to the format of the presentation I do every year, uh, going through the operating budget with the most emphasis on the general fund. Um, this is the general fund fund statement. Uh, we'll start with um, revenues coming into the general fund and this is presented by category. The largest category of revenues in the general fund is property taxes. Uh, one may, or seven million one hundred forty-four thousand in property taxes in the general fund. Smaller amounts of utility taxes, twenty-six thousand. Uh, hotel motel taxes, a strong year, four hundred forty-one thousand. Uh, cable franchise fees, one hundred seventy-six thousand. Uh, utility franchise fees, eighty-one thousand. Uh, licenses and permits, 860 or 426,000. Uh, fines and forfeits, 862,000. Intergovernmental revenue, uh, that's um, 890,000. And that's uh, payments from other governmental entities, uh, state government, federal gov government, any county and other um, cities or other entities. Charges for services, 579,000. Uh, use of money and property, that's rents and interest. Uh, that's 138,000. And there is a whole host of other revenues totaling uh, over 804,000. So total revenues about 11.5 million for the year in the general fund. Nancy, do you know why we've had such an increase in our hotel motel? Um, we, that has fluctuated in recent years. Uh, we've had a, a relatively strong year before and then the next year it goes down. So we really, um, the detail of it is not available from the state. The, the hotel motel tax is paid to the state and they give it to us quarterly. But we um, can't attribute it to more soccer tournaments or we don't know if it's we really from. can't yeah. attribute it to that and we cannot get a breakdown of um, the hotel motel tax by facility either but it was a very very good year whatever it was I'd like to see if we could find out so we could increase or make sure we're focusing on that I don't know that information is available through a, a trade association of hotels and motels you just have to pay for it can be done. The question is how much do we want to pay for that information, I guess. I'm sorry, Tom, it is available? Oh, sure. From It's a trade association. I don't recall the name of it, but it's available. You routinely see it in feasibility studies when somebody wants to build a new hotel. That, that sort of information is available. You know my theory on why it goes up and down. Mm -hmm. uh, no. It's, it is all to do with the who's, you know, who's staying here. Could be could be a bit uptick in business. Could be uptick in special events, soccer tournaments. You just year yeah. to year it moves around. Uh, I, sorry, we can move on. Now. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 
Uh, this yeah, so you, do you have any idea on the hotel tax, how much of an increase because of additional hotel motels? Um, I think it was an increase of, I, I think it's 60 or 70,000 higher than last year, but we really don't have a, we really can't track where it's from. Okay. Uh, this next page starts the expenditures in the general fund and it's grouped by function, uh, the largest function, and, and then it's further broken out by current and capital outlay. Uh, the largest function is public safety, which is police, fire, um, animal control, and that's 8.8 .8 million. Uh, public works, and that's the various uh, activities in public <coughs> works, roadway maintenance, snow and ice, street cleaning, traffic control, engineering, public works admin, uh, 2,262,000. Uh, health and social services, that's our subsidies, 45,000. Culture and recreation, 2.9 million. And that includes library, art center, and the various park and recreation activities that are in the general fund. Uh, community and economic development, 764,000. And that includes the regular um, community development um, office <coughs> that um, handles a lot of the inspections. Um, and, and then also it includes the um, uh, subsidies for economic development that we uh, make to the chamber. Uh, general government, um, 2,574,000. Uh, that incl includes all the a administrative um, activities in the general fund. Uh, mayor and council, city administrator, finance, IT, HR, um, risk management, which includes the city's insurance, uh, legal services, and building and grounds operations. So that's a uh, overall of uh, those activities. In the capital outlay section, those same functions, um, public safety had an additional 113,000, public works 487,000, culture and recreation, 148,000, a small amount um, in community development, about 3,000, and general government, 16.4. So the total expenditures in the general fund, about 18.2 million. <coughs> uh, so before transfers, revenues are actually under expenditures in the general fund by uh, 6,674,000. On the next slide um, um, are our other financing sources and uses, which is transfers in and transfers out. Uh, we do have a significant amount of transfers in, 7.5 million. Um, a significant part of that is the transfer in from the Employee uh, Benefit Tax Levy Fund. Um, another large part is road use tax funds. Uh, the ambulance fund for a prorated part of um, uh, the staff that does ambulance in the fire department, perpetual care interest, and TIF funds that are transferred in. There's a smaller amount of transfers out, uh, 626,000, and uh, most of that is um, tax levy proceeds that are required to be received in the general fund and then transferred out uh, the levy tax levy to fund, pro fund project costs and the transit tax levy. Uh, there's also the transfers to the equipment replacement fund and computer replacement funds. So the net amount of the transfers in and transfers out adds 6.9 million um, and then that calculates to um, Revenues and, and transfers in being over expenditures and transfers out by 250,000. Uh, we add that to the beginning balance uh, to get an ending fund balance before encumbrances of about 4.5 million. We have 211,000 in encumbrances, which is basically outstanding purchase orders uh, to come down to an unreserved ending balance of uh, about $4.3 million. Uh, the next page uh, kind of does an analysis on, on how things um, came in, revenues and expenditures. Um, 
um, and overall fund balance. Um, when we did the original budget in um, March of 15 for the 16, 17 year, we thought the ending balance would be uh, 3,667,000. When we did the um, revised estimate, uh, we thought it would be 4,356,000, uh, primarily because of increased um, beginning fund balance. And then that actual ending ba balance is 4,312,000, which is slightly under the revised estimate by 44,000. Um, the funding fund balance as a percent of expenditures is 22.8% of expenditures. Um, we had um, um, the original budget projected 19.5%, so it's significantly higher than the original budget. Uh, the revised estimate projected 23.0%, so we are slightly under on a percentage basis. Uh, but if we take into account uh, outstanding purchase orders for items that will be funded from road use tax, it does look um, higher than that. And that's what's in the boxed area there. If um, we exclude the road use tax funded encumbrances, the fund balance would actually be 4478000 which would be 121000 higher than our ending balance. And if you calculate that as a percentage of um, expenditures, it would be 23.7%. And those um, road use taxes will be used to fund those encumbrances as they're paid this year. Can I jump in, Nancy? Sure. Just to say we had a good year. <laughs> we really did. Yeah. And we, did we did have it, a good year. You know, we, we were able to, because of this kind of performance consistently, in the last several years increase our policy that says we should never be under 16.7 percent that it wasn't all that long ago we were at 10 percent uh, the reality is if we keep this up you know we can increase that goal again and it ought to be 25 percent sometime you know that, that that points to the financial health of the city and that's a good thing so again had a great year for in for everybody involved. And good bond ratings and returns. Yes, yes. We've, we've maintained our, our uh, yeah. bond rating and I don't expect that to change any, do you? Yeah, I, I don't expect it to yeah. change. So. Thanks. Sure. <coughs> the next page kind of does a, starts an analysis of the items that were over and under our estimate. The um, uh, first page there is revenues in total, revenues and transfers in, actually were under by 138,000. Um, the, um, and I'll just kind of run through some of these quickly. Uh, tax collections were actually over our estimate by 14,300. Uh, utility taxes ut and utility franchise fees and the state reimbursement were slightly under. Uh, cable franchise fees were under by about 13,000. The road use tax transfer in was under by 227,000. A lot of that is those um, outstanding purchase orders uh, that will be funded uh, in the upcoming year. Employee benefits transfer in was actually over the revised estimate. Um, and that's the corresponding expenditures were slightly over due to retirement pay of uh, one person that wasn't included in the revised estimate. Uh, transfer in from health insurance was under 5,300. And again, because expenditures were under. Hotel motel tax was uh, over by 76,000. And we did have the original revised estimate based on last year's actual. So that's about the amount of the increase from the prior year. Uh, good year in uh, building and zoning for um, building permits. That was over 19,000. Nancy? Sure. If I may, please. On the page, uh, road use tax transfer, that's the, uh, the gas tax the state gives us. Yes. And uh, how, how do we miss that one? 
this is more, and I will get to the road use tax fund itself later. This is the part of the road use tax that goes into the general fund to fund operations. The overall road use tax fund also funds some capital projects. So, right. so what she was saying is we have some outstanding work orders mm -hmm. that, that did not get paid for by June 30th, but you're going to see it, it, it basically moves to the next fiscal year, and that accounts for that change. Okay, that, but that's what that is. is Reve revenue is not down. Revenue and road use is actually higher. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. When we get to the, what goes into the fund, that came in very good this year. Thank you. I think we were ready to go to the next page. Uh, some of the next um, areas were slightly under budget. Uh, library and Arts Center were under by 1,000 each. Parks and Rec in total under by 5,700. Cemetery under 3,500. Public Works under 4,200. Uh, police grants actually came in over by 6,800. Court fines were under 13,000. Um, the ATE, the traffic camera um, revenues, came in under by about 48,000. And that's directly tied to um, the mandate to shut the um, camera off at the University um, 61 intersection, and that was effective in April. Nancy, uh, isn't the tr the car though picking up some of that? Now that we, because the car was about the same time as that got closed off. Um, I haven't looked at the actual number of tickets, but I assume it's less okay. than what was. Um, what was brought in? What was brought in, and, and and the number of tickets issued. That's a heavily traveled road out there, probably a, higher than the residential streets that the car is on. Mm -hmm. Um, other police revenues came in over by 63,000. Of that, 41,500 was the donation for the special re response team equipment. Uh, licenses and permits were slightly over. Uh, fire department revenues, it looks like they're under by 16,000, but we had budgeted for a $30,000 donation. We were expect hoping to get one um, and, and that didn't um, come through. So without that, the regular uh, line items for fire revenues are over budget. Interest rates are rebounding some, so our interest is over by 17,000. And the, the various others net out to a $2,800 reduction. Uh, so between um, uh, uh, revenues are very strong, it's uh, the total is under only because of the transfers in. Uh, next page, we'll look at expenditures. And in total, expenditures were under the revised estimate by about 95,000. Uh, no items carried forward this year, which is um, a good year. Everything was, um, the purchase order was issued for the capital outlay items. Um, and so the, I'm showing the, um, the expenditures compared to the original revised estimate, not the final amended budget. Uh, the general government activities were over by about 47,000. We did amend the budget um, in May, so we were under the amended budget by 74,000, but it was higher than the original revised estimate. Uh, public safety <clears throat> was under uh, 1,400. Library, Arts Center, and Parks under by 40, about 43,000. Community and Economic Development under by 25,000. Uh, public Works in total, and that's after the encumbrances, uh, under by 53,000. Uh, the airport subsidy actually came in under by, uh, by 19,000. Um, they had a, a good year. Um, expenditure and revenue wise in, in the airport fund. And then the transfers out is actually slightly over because the revenue coming in was, was over. So between um, expenditures coming in under and strong revenues that accounts for the increase in the general fund fund balance. Got a couple charts here um, and this is um, what uh, 
Councilman Spread was talking about, uh, we have been able to increase the general fund, fund balance uh, pretty significantly over the last 10 years. And the first chart is in a, um, dollars. And some of the decreases in FY12-13 uh, were planned decreases where um, City Council chose to fund some major equipment items out of the general fund balance rather than bonding for them. And we actually um, uh, purchased a fire engine and the financial software out of general fund balance. And in prior years, we wouldn't have had those funds available if we didn't have the strong general fund balance. Uh, the <coughs> next slide uh, shows the percent of that the, the fund balance is of operating expenditures. And that does show how we started out as 10, 11 percent um, nine, 10 years ago and have built it up to the 22, 23 percent uh, that we've had the last several years. And again, those dips were planned uses of fund balance in FY13 and FY14. Uh, the next page, we start the, um, the other funds other than general fund. And I picked out some and their, the, their footnotes later in the slides. Uh, I'll kind of run through those and you can refer to the footnotes um, either now or later. We've got the funds listed on the left-hand column. We show the originally budgeted ending balance, the revised estimate ending balance, the actual ending balance, and whether that ending balance is favorable or unfavorable. Um, so for the general fund, which we just reviewed, um, it appears that it's unfavorable by 44,000, but yet those road use tax encumbrances um, kind of skew things so it actually is a favorable ending balance. Um, some of the other ones, uh, debt service is o over our projection by about 14,000. Uh, tax collections actually came in higher by 9,400. Higher interest, um, about 3,400. Um, and the bond paying agency agent fees were slightly under. Uh, then we go to the enterprise funds. Uh, the first one is the water pollution control fund, the sewer collect sewer fund. Uh, that came in over by 178,000. Revenues were 91,000 higher and expenditures were under the budget by 86,000. Collection and drainage, um, 63,000 higher than what we'd estimated. Um, expenditures were under by 51,700 uh, and revenues were slightly over by 4,700. Uh, going down to refuse collection, uh, we do show that we have an ending fund balance deficit in the um, uh, refuse collection fund, about 237,000. That's 23,000 better than what we projected. We projected a $260,000 deficit. That deficit is because is uh, due to buying that second automated truck. Um, we knew it would put the fund in a deficit, but um, the efficiencies going forward, uh, we expect that deficit to be eliminated in the next two years. Landfill fund shows that we're um, 277,000 higher than estimated. Um, landfill revenues were actually slightly under by 1,600, um, but expenditures were under by 278,000. Uh, we do have some an allocation about 95,000 uh, for groundwater monitoring that has been carried forward to the next year. Transfer station um, shows that we're um, 72,000 higher than what we'd expected. Uh, in the transfer station, the original budget, we thought it would be actually a deficit of 110. Revised estimate uh, was at 93,000 and ending balance was at 166,000. Um, transfer station revenues were 27,000 higher and um, expenditures were under by about $45,000. Um, going down to the parking fund, 
uh, that came down out 22,000 higher than what we'd estimated. Revenues were over by 10,500 and expenditures were under by 11,900. Uh, transit, uh, pretty significant um, amount over our estimate, 170,000. Um, revenues were over by 87,000 and expenditures were under by 83,000. Uh, the revenues are uh, primarily due to the um, 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 Medicaid uh, fees. Uh, they were successful in getting um, contracts with the Medicare providers and that was privatized at the state level. So we were, uh, we probably budgeted pretty conservatively because there was some uncertainty there. Uh, but that, those revenues did come in and we have a strong balance going forward in the, in the transit fund. Golf course, um, just slightly higher than what we'd estimated. Actually, golf course revenues were under by 70,000, um, but its expenditures were under by 72,000, so just slightly better. Um, Boat Harbor, um, it's actually showing a, a deficit balance of 98,000. That's a little misleading. Um, we had an encumbrances out at year end for the storm damage repair of about 91,700, and that will be covered by insurance. But um, they weren't able to do the work before June 30th, and that's the storm, storm damage. But even with that, um, taking into account the insurance reimbursements, there will still be a deficit of about 6,900 in the Boat Harbor Fund. Uh, revenues were under the revised estimate by 9,500, and expenditures were under by 400. Um, and some of that is also um, related to the storm. Uh, people didn't get their boats in and the facility wasn't um, uh, as occupied as it usually is this year. So we'll look at that as we um, do the budget in this coming year. Um, Ambulance, um, it came out 98,000 higher than our estimate. Uh, revenues were over by 82,000 and expenditures were under by 16,000. Um, strong um, number of ambulance runs and um, it appears a, a higher collection rate with a new billing company as well. CVB um, is over our estimate by 26,000. Revenues were slightly over by 2,300, or they were slightly under by 2,300, and expenditures were under by 28,5. Um, then we um, go to the internal service funds. Uh, equipment services, that's the city garage, it came out 41,000 higher. Uh, the health insurance fund, at least as of June 30th, um, it was um, 397,000 um, better than what we had estimated it, it potentially could have been. Um, that is um, uh, the claims and admin fees were under by 418,000. Uh, the wellness transfer was less by 5,300 and revenues were less by 62,000 or 26,400. Dental insurance was also um, 15,700 higher than what we projected. Uh, claims were 17,000 less and revenues were about 2,000 less. Go to the next slide. And these are our special revenue funds. And I will just talk about a few of them. The employee benefits fund, just slightly higher than what we'd anticipated. Um, the small business forgivable loan fund that shows 81,000. And that those are um, funds from last year's allocation that weren't um, allocated as of June 30th, but they, that has been carried forward to the upcoming year. Local option sales tax, um, 222,000 less than what we projected. That's a little misleading. We um, uh, actually received the monthly check that we us usually get in July and accrue 
and can't transfer by June 30. We actually <coughs> received that at the end of June, so we were able to transfer that out and still keep a, a non-negative number in that, in that fund. Road use tax shows 385,000 higher. And this is, um, the road use tax revenues actually came in 189,000 higher than what we projected. So a strong uh, revenues from road use tax during the year. And then the funding transfers out were 196,000 less than the original revised estimate. But of that 165 is for those outstanding purchase orders. So a lot of that increase is from increased um, road use tax revenues coming in. Um, South End TIF, about 26,000 higher. And again, this is um, primarily because um, we didn't pay the one uh, TIF rebate um, due to their non-compliance with, with the development agreement. And I'll skip down to the housing programs. Um, public housing, Clark House Sun Sunset Park. Um, uh, it's higher by about 40,000, but it's still a minimal fund balance for that size of operation. Uh, expenditures were under by 37,000 and revenues were slightly higher by 3,000. Uh, the Section 8 voucher program, it's showing 56,000 higher. Uh, 30, revenues were 30,000 less than estimated and expenditures were 87,000. And, and generally, except for the admin money that HUD pays us, um, uh, the housing assistance payments themselves are restricted. So if we have those at fiscal year end, they have to be used for housing assistance payments in the upcoming year. So overall, most of the um, Funds. I mean, the total says we're 1.7 million higher than what we projected for the operating funds, with, which is very good. Um, and then the next two slides are the footnotes to those statements. So the last slide is the summary. As we stated before, um, good, strong general fund, fund balance at year end, 22.8% of expenditures, higher than the original budget of 19.5 and slightly lower than the revised estimate. Uh, that ending balance meets, more than meets the uh, minimum fund balance requirements in the general fund balance policy. Um, that ending balance also positions us uh, pretty well going into the next fiscal year. There are some challenges coming up. Um, uh, the one is the um, loss of the ATE fines from the university intersection unless our appeal is successful. Other challenges that um, uh, may include a reduction in that state reimbursement for commercial and industrial. There has been some talk um, at the state level about um, reducing those allocations to local governments because of the states, when the state tries to balance their, their budget. Um, then there will also be the um, continued phased in rollback of the multi-residential properties. Uh, they, they get reduced 3.75% a year until they're equal to um, regular residential rollback. Um, again, I noted it before, but there's positive balances in all the funds except for refuse collection, and that was a planned deficit in that fund, and the boat harbor, and that was um, due to the windstorm and weather conditions this year. Uh, but most other funds have ending balances close to or higher than projected and are in a good position going forward. Um, questions, but I wanna mention too that um, the auditors were in for the final time the last weekend in September. So we have now closed the fiscal year and the full fiscal year 16, 17 is on open gov. So if um, you wanna look at any of the reports graphically, those are now available on open gov. 
the book I handed out last week, there is a number of you know, detailed <coughs> department um, revenue and expenditure um, statements you know you can review. I've also got um, um, the investment transactions for the year towards the end and uh, changes in um, outstanding debt. Any questions? Good job. You were a little skeptical about the state back bill even two years ago, weren't you? Um, it appears more possible now. In, in, in round numbers or rough terms, can you tell us what that risk is? How much is the backfill that we may or may not get? Um, I would hope it wouldn't. They wouldn't cut it completely. Yeah. Um, I did percent. Well, I was hmm? going to say. You, I, I did the calculation. Yeah. I just can't remember it now. Okay. But I can get that. Twenty-five percent was around one hundred and fifty-seven thousand dollars. Uh, Fifty percent was so double that amount, a little over three hundred thousand dollars. Okay. But during the budget, we will have a plan and sure. maybe have more more information. Any questions for Nancy? Good job. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate Thanks, it. Yeah. Next, we're going to talk about <coughs> city code changes and property maintenance. I'll take that Why Andy is on his way up to the podium as well. Uh, mainly ministerial items, other than the three items that Andy's going to briefly talk about tonight, and it's really just a handoff so that you can start taking a look at things. Um, what you have on page one is, is simply a list of the ordinances that have been adopted uh, since the city code book was um, uh, combined or updated, and uh, Tran keeps a list of those on the city's website. So it's um, before the end of the year and Fran's departure, I'd ask that we try and get the code book up to date. Um, and those items that are appropriate, we'll be bringing those back for uh, an update of the city code. And then the plan going forward is to simply uh, amend the city code book as the ordinance is adopted. Um, so that's simply a list and it's frankly just pulled off of the city's website. But, uh, we keep a list of those on, on there as well. So those will be coming forward. Uh, the next item are, again, some ministerial items uh, under the police department. Frankly, it's just a, a, a two-word addition, the, uh, as you note there, uh, just to clarify uh, the seizure and impoundment disposition uh, uh, is uh, for dangerous and vicious, not simply for dangerous. Um, so that's just really a two-word uh, ministerial item. Uh, the other items were provided by uh, Christy Corpy and really are just some clarifications uh, to current practices or, or definitions. Uh, d uh, dumpster, trash can versus trash cart and, and our current practices that we adopted uh, here uh, a little while just to clarify and make sure that the code is consistent with the policies that the council has implemented to date. And then the, the last item, um, Andrew has a couple comments on as, as well. These are some items that we'll be bringing forward for discussion. Really just wanted to hand off tonight. Andy has a couple comments uh, for each one. But bringing forward the property maintenance code, there's been a lot of discussion uh, on, on this topic as well. Home-based businesses, we've, we've had a few issues uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and that we'd like to bring forward for discussion as well as the site and ordinance. This is a continuation of the zoning ordinance update. Uh, and uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Andy. Thanks. Mayor, Council, um, so touching on what you got in terms of the for property maintenance, what you have is the International Property Maintenance Code, which is a document put together by the International Code Council, which is the same organization that puts together the, the building codes that we've had adopted. Uh, and the reason provided for that is I think this is a pretty good look at what a, a truly comprehensive property maintenance code looks like. And so I think that that's a, looking at that's a good point, jumping off point for discussion on whether whether and whether we want to do something like that and what it might look like. Um, so I guess uh, what I'd encourage you to do is kind of take a look it over and see all the different issues that it, they can address and how it addresses it. And then we'll come back at a later date and kind of discuss, you know, do we want to do all of it? Or is there parts of it that like, parts of it that don't make sense? But I think this is a pretty good comprehensive look of, of what the entire universe of a property maintenance code could be. Andrew, are there other 
<coughs> what other cities in Iowa have established something like this, so, or nearby? I don't care where it's placed. I can get back to you on that. I don't know that off the top of my head. There are some. Yeah, no, yeah, it's not an uncommon thing, so. Just to comment, I've, I've had some people bring uh, what they perceive as neighborhood problems to me, and, and you and Greg have responded that if we had something like this, we could address them, but without it, we can't. Is that I, correct? I think that's a fair statement, yeah. This would add more tools to our toolbox in addition to simple nuisance abatement. And so, yeah, if this, you know, this is something that the council is interested in, we can bring up much more detailed proposal back to you at a later date. This is probably an unfair question, but because uh, I'm sure you are familiar with every comma in the, in the information, but on 3rd Street, about two or three blocks up, the purple house mm -hmm. has been sitting yep, there. Yep, familiar with it. Uh, and it affects everybody else's property value. Right now, the policy seems to be if they're paying their property taxes, they can do any darn thing they want to with it, including nothing. How would this ordinance affect that sort of situation? Well, right now, so you said they have to just pay their taxes. That's not quite true. I mean, you still have to shovel the snow, cut the grass. This would provide additional standards to how the structure would have to be maintained and then allow us to take action if they did not. So, I mean, in many senses, that that's one type of issue that something like this would be designed to address. That would include paint? Paint, yeah, paint, uh, you know, peeling paint would be a, a very good example of a kind of a classic type thing that a property maintenance code would address, yes. Thank you. Thank you. What, what, what proposals are you talking about home-based businesses? I, I can get into what, I, I can get into that with when, if, you, if you all are done with the property maintenance code, I can kind of, I can kind of walk you through what we've provided to you. Anything else on property maintenance or, okay. So uh, we have had some issues with our rules regarding home-based business right now. It, it's largely governed by a definition contained within the zoning code, which isn't ideal. Um, I think in a lot of times we're having kind of the worst possible outcome where you're kind of stifling people's entrepreneurial, on, you know, being entrepreneurial, excuse me, but yet not necessarily protecting the neighbors from the negative side effects of their business of the, these home-based businesses that do currently exist. Um, so what I've kind of done and what I provided you is, is kind of take a look at what's considered current best practices in terms of regulating home occupancies with the idea of allowing as much home-based business as possible without negatively impacting the neighbors. And I won't go into, into great detail because this is just kind of the handoff tonight, but basically uh, kind of go through the, kind of the main things it addresses. The first thing it kind of addresses is some standards to establish that any home-based business is an accessory to a home use rather than the primary use. Uh, then there's a list of 13 particular prohibited activities and materials and things like that. Uh, and then I think one of the more important thing is, is a list of standards that basically with the aim of, of preventing any exterior evidence of, of business taking place. So from the outside, it looks just like a regular home. Um, and then one of the biggest issues always with this type of use is Vehicles, parking, and traffic, you know, there's a number, number of rules, and then when we, when we come back with this, we can get into the particulars of what you might like to see on that. Uh, rules regarding customers, delivery, pickup of items, employees, and hours of operation. So those are kind of the, the topics that this will address. And so I guess kind of what we're looking at is just kind of what your particular concerns and thoughts are on that, and then we'll take this, combine what you say tonight, start and, and start with the planning mission is where all zoning ordinances change start then bring you a, a fully fleshed out proposal with an analysis and a memo. It seems to me like it has a lot of sensible, reasonable components to it. Right, and so this, I, I didn't, I did not create this out of whole cloth. Um, the, there is one, I believe it's in San Diego that, that they've adopted very similar to this and has, is well regarded and got a lot of good reviews. So I kind of use that as the model. and as is a number of other communities. Do you feel we have a problem with what home-based businesses are doing now that created this? I do think there's some instances where there's it, the 
it, it is affecting the neighbors, but they, they do meet the very technical definition of what we're doing. And then on the other hand, which isn't as visible, there are things that people call and ask, can they do at home, which would have zero impact on the neighbors, but because of our current rules, we also have to say, say no. So I, I think um, we've had these current rules in place for 40 or 50 years. I think it just makes sense to kind of look at updating them. And like I said, the guiding principle is allow people to do as much as they can, but, but yet has no more impact on the neighbors than regular residential use and that's kind of what you're trying to calibrate these re <coughs> calibrate these regulations to do or at least that would be my recommendation some common complaints include parking parking in the front yard outdoor storage yeah. noise um, th uh, we get those uh, and have had uh, quite a few of those recently traffic the when intent come, came up when I was on the commissions were like somebody wanted to put a beauty shop in their home, you know, one chair type of a thing, but uh, that was one of the ones that I remember. Right, so right now, I mean, and that, that, that kind of brings <coughs> up another point. So right now, in, in most, re all residential districts, you can have a beauty shop with a conditional use permit, yet there isn't that same opportunity for other type of home-based businesses that have the same or a less of an impact, but because they have one or two customers a day coming to it. So also kind of taking a look at whether or not that's necessarily how we want to proceed with that. <coughs> it's important to remember that the primary use is as a dwelling or a home and not as a business, and that needs to be I know, but how do you very clear. How do you remove the potentials of not stifling the entrepreneurship of them, as you mentioned? It gets to feeling especially with the property maintenance to a little big brother-ish. Yeah, I, I think that I think that's a legitimate a legitimate concern. So I, I think, you know, that that's kind of you just count what, what what's appropriate for the, this community. And I think that that's the discussion that we need to have. I, I think what what I provided you does is, is, is a good job laying out. These are the different areas you need to regulate, but whether or not you can have one or two vehicles or what those exact standards are that, that that's what we need to have the discussion on in my opinion try to strike a balance because in right. the cases that have been brought to me there was complaints yeah. by all the neighbors so they've got a well that that's part of the part of the deal th in my opinion that's the difficulty because you, you have two very legitimate interests kind of right. that, that you have to balance and so i think that's why it's time to talk about this again I have a huge family and I probably have more people come to my house every day than a business would but I guess I just I, I think about the entrepreneur that starts his business out of his garage and moves growing how would you how would you say that that's a fair statement most people start with nothing and so it's a challenge for me to think about that and saying no, no how question. do you do that I mean, the, I'm just the property thinking, owner has rights yeah. yeah. So, so it's it's. On the other hand, I get a lot of calls, in particular about a business on ISIT, and I've forwarded those to city staff, and then they're kind of handcuffed, you know. So you have to to find that balance between the uh, the property rights of the, you know, the rights of the property owner, yeah. and their neighbors. That's the challenge. But well, we're just reviewing it. Right. Yeah. We'll bring it. You know. And that It'd be interesting to know of of other communities <coughs> in Iowa whether they have the either one of these two well, almost all communities do have rules on this um, I would so I, I think in a lot of respects this is a relaxing of it in some areas but tightening it in the others but overall I would say this would probably allow for more home-based businesses than we currently have and while at the same time hopefully addressing there's a, a few examples I don't want to call anyone out by name where it is irritating the neighbors where we kind of deal with those particular aspects of those operations, but yet allow probably for more people to do overall. I think to me that, that, that that's the goal with this. So let me ask you this, Andrew. Could we potentially look at, if we were to evaluate your property maintenance program better, could we make a hybrid of sorts that would address potentially some homemade ba home based businesses, but not really affecting like what you're? I think you do two things. I, I mean, I, I still think that's always going to remain two separate parts of code, but yeah, I think you can look at kind of doing it together and, and making sure that they, they fit nicely together. But 
there's a point at which it's really not a home-based business anymore that doesn't belong in a residential neighborhood. And, and I think you've got to balance the, the interests of both the property owner and the adjacent property owners. You should, should, a, should a business ha have six, seven, eight cars parked on, in, uh, in their driveway and they're all across their front lawn uh, in, in materials and, and equipment stored outside? At that point in time, you're probably no longer a home-based business with, with, uh, with the with the owner that you're, as the only employee of the business. Um, uh, it would be questionable. So, I mean, at some point in time, it's time to move outside of the home and, and into a, an appropriate location. I'll, I'll review it some more. Yeah, I, I look. I, yeah, I, I look forward to all your comments because I, I think. That, where that balance is, that, that that really comes from you. Okay. If you don't have anything, I move on to the last piece, which sure. is the sign regulations, which seems like we've been talking about for quite some time. But uh, what you have before you is this is now been vetted by legal. Um, uh, just to kind of back up a little bit, there was about 18 months ago a, a major Supreme Court ruling, Reed versus the town of Gilbert on signs, which kind of basically threw everybody's sign, particularly as it relates to temporary signs, out the door. So this is now kind of the approach that I think we can take that will work, um, kind of focus in on temporary signs. Um, the real difficulty with the, the Supreme Court ruling is it mandates a pretty strict form of content neutrality. Uh, so, so in practical terms, what that means is, is normally in years past, you know, say take a residential area that signs are, you know, temporary signs are pretty much banned. Well, they are banned and they're currently in the city musk theme, but we had a lot of exemptions, you know, political signs, real estate signs, grand opening signs, et cetera. Uh, under, under this new court ruling, essentially, that's no longer permissible to favor one type of sign like that or another. Um, so the, it's it, not the most sensible court ruling ever, but it is what we have to deal with. And so communities, essentially what the workaround has been fine, just fine, you treat them all the same. Let, let's take the example of real estate signs. So you can't say, well, we don't really want a lot of signs in residential areas, but obviously you do want to allow for, for sale signs. So instead of saying, for sale signs are allowed, what the code would now say, it's kind of convoluted, but it, when a house is for sale, a, a sign is allowed. And you can, with your one sign that's now allowed, you could put whatever you want. You could probably use it for a real estate sign, but somebody technically took the other way. And the other one, for example, would be during election season, you're allowed a large number of signs. They don't necessarily have to be campaign signs, so far on the like. And the other thing that it does, instead of Currently, just, we just ban temporary signs in businesses. That doesn't really seem to be the way that it plays out. Um, so kind of recognize that it allows it in a, a limited manner where they have to register that they're putting up the larger one. And then it regulates based on the type of material, how long they can be up with the ideas. I think one of the things you really don't want is a, you know, the banner or whatever that's been left up for a year and it's all ratty looking. So based on the material, they're allowed to be longer. So, you know, a paper sign, you can have up for 48 hours, a, a wood <coughs> sign, a number of months, and then you have to have a period of time where there's no signs on your property, so they do remain a temporary thing. And this is kind of, once again, kind of based on some approaches from other areas. So that would be the piece I would encourage you to look closely at and give some feedback on, because my, my intent is then to bring this forward through the P&Z and through the formal channels for adoption. Assuming you're comfortable with everything that you've heard tonight. Andrew, on <clears throat> obsolete signs or signs where the business goes the business goes out of business, who do you approach to enforce the regulation? Uh, There's always a property owner. Okay. And and ultimately that who is who's responsible for the, the signage on the property. That's kind of been a subject that has bothered me in the years past. That there's a, a sign up for a business that hasn't been there for five years. You know, right? And, and that, that's a that's a common complaint. That that that's why we drafted that into the, the sign. So code. does this change help you deal with that? Absolutely. This helps. Right now, it 
the time code is very difficult to enforce for a whole host of reasons, and this will make it a lot easier easier to enforce and easier for the public to understand and deal with. Any other questions for Andrew? Thank you. Okay. Next, we're going to talk about tax abatement versus tax increment financing. Who's doing Thank that? Thank you, Your Honor. I'll, I'll start off with that. Andrew and uh, Nancy and, and Dave uh, and I have had several discussions on the topic along with our bond council as well. And, and our, we brought it forward for some initial discussion a few weeks back as well. And uh, of course, we have uh, three individual requests for support um, for tax credit, uh, the state's tax credit program as well. Um, it's not as simple as, as, it, as it first seemed, and, and uh, it seems to have you know, gotten more complicated with each uh, conversation that we've had. Uh, but we've, we've tried to put together a, just a brief outline tonight, and I'm going to break it into a few different parts. Um, one, some basic improvements or suggestions for uh, the tax payment areas uh, that we currently have in place. Andrew also has uh, put together some maps for us as well to, to, uh, to take a look at and, s and some changes to our current tax abatement program. Then three, or secondly, the, s the specific requests that we have um, from the three housing projects. Um, and then uh, we'll touch on the maps as well. Uh, so what, what we're looking at or recommending at this point in time, and I'd like to get some feedback on, uh, I'm going to start with residential. Uh, so residential, new homes, there's really nothing uh, additional that we can, we can provide at this point in time under, under the current state code um, for new, new homes, new construction that are not in either blighted or historic districts. However, in blighted or historic districts, we can, as a community, choose to go up to a 10-year 100% abatement. Uh, so the question becomes... Um, is it important? Uh, well, maybe, maybe that's not the right way to word it, but how far do we want to go to incent either improvements or uh, new homes in those districts? Um, <coughs> we, as noted earlier, <coughs> the maximum allowable is 10 years, 100%, and currently in, in blighted areas for a new home, we have a five-year 100% um, with a minimum assessed value of, uh, of $175,000. <coughs> excuse me, uh, minimum assessed value of 175000 Improvements, three years, 100%, minimum 10% increase. Uh, and uh, as well for historic, uh, we, we make a distinction between historically sensitive and new homes <coughs> in those areas. So the question really becomes, uh, how far do we wish to incent folks to, to build or to improve their, their homes in those districts or, or to build on, on those lots that are now uh, buildable lots under a new zoning ordinance, and are we willing to go uh, to, to the maximum or something less than maximum? So under state code, as I said, 10 years, 100% is the maximum, or you can do something less than that. And so really the, the, the uh, discussion is, what, was the what, is, what is the council's interest in, 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 in new homes or new residential in those blighted and historic districts? So we are, what, two or three years into the residential tax abate program now? Correct. Can you give us maybe a summary of how that's gone? I know there's a lot of new construction, particularly like out on Claremont. I believe we've had two or three in blighted and historic districts. Most of the tax abatement programs that have been taken advantage of for new residential has been out right. um, in those new, uh, in, in the uh, Claremont and uh, area in and around Claremont. Just within the last month, I think there was something down on Grandview Avenue, wasn't, wasn't there, as an abatement? There was a recent abatement. I don't remember, remember the address. But in, these, but in these blighted and historic districts, there's been very little use. Uh, improvement or otherwise and uh, really so it's our suggestion that we do something more and uh, in, in, uh, to incent in these areas I mean we've got some real need in these in these districts uh, to, to have some improvements in, and uh, to take advantage of that it's always cheaper to, to build a new home where we already have infrastructure as well so on these buildable lots um, so I guess the question is I'm trying to figure out where the council is on, on this issue and where where you'd like us to come back with uh, to, in, uh, to incent, you know, keep the current program in place, or if we're, if we're willing to do something more to incent those improvements or um, 
buildings in, in uh, residential blighted and historic districts. Would there be a range where you could bump it up and still be less than the maximum and see what? Most definitely, you could do a ten. You could do a ten-year program. You could do a ten-year declining scale. You could do a five, six, seven, eight, eight-year program. Um, you, you could do something less than a hundred percent, so that there are taxes coming in to the city to pay for, uh, excuse me, use of city services, for example. So you've got a wide range, and if the council is interested in doing something more than than what we currently have in place, uh, I guess that's what we need to know. Um, Something like that would make sense to me. Absolutely. Just my opinion. Greg, is this uh, applied to owner occupied or or other categories? It really doesn't matter. The the owner gets the benefit. Yeah. The, the individual paying the taxes. Right. So, can we review potentially making the assessed value like seventy five thousand versus it being one hundred and seventy five thousand dollars? So it affects more homeowners in those blighted areas. Yes, you've got you've got a lot more flexibility when there is a blight designation because it's or still a saying, I mean, you're still stating that you want them to say that they make an improvement a minimum of ten percent of the home value. No, we're suggesting that you go to at least five years, a hundred percent, with no minimum. Uh, other than remodeling, we think you've got to have at least some minimum with remodeling, and we're suggesting that we maintain that 10 percent. I'd be in favor of making it as attractive as possible. That, that's what I'm looking at. I mean, attractive as more, possible would be 10 years at 100 percent. So I'm not sure if the, if the council I, was willing to go more, quite that more far. With a five year, 100 percent. Right. But I'm looking at more. Can we, to make it more attractive to more homeowners, it be a Seventy-five thousand dollars assessed value versus one hundred and seventy-five thousand, because then you're not going to have, you know, so many homeowners that are going to. Most of the homeowners probably, and a lot of those areas that are highlighted are probably between one hundred and one hundred twenty-five thousand dollar homes, and and maybe higher. But mm -hmm. but then they're not even qualified for because we have it at one hundred seventy-five. You don't have to have a minimum at all. I think that isn't there. A isn't the average assessed valuation, a residential assessed valuation, something like eighty-three thousand or eighty-seven thousand? I, I remember. I believe you brought that up at one point in time. I, I don't recall off the top of my head. But not in those blighted areas. I think if we had an average for that blighted areas that are highlighted, I think that's what I'm getting at. Mm -hmm. well, and you I would could, be looking at definitely lower or more or average for that. Then we can say, okay, then we we are getting the, the larger percentage of that group. You could definitely lower or remove the minimum. So, something like 52% of the city's incentive. considered blighted. Wow. Well, yeah. It's largely the downtown area and, yeah, and, and, and the surrounding yeah, areas. Because if, yeah. it's, if, you're, if you're saying your minimum is that, then you're not, you're not allowing that. That's all I'm getting at. Absolutely. Okay. So, it's five years, 100% uh, with, with a lower or no minimum? The average, with the average of the blighted areas. If that's eighty-three thousand, if that's seventy-five thousand, if that's a hundred thousand, would that be a consensus yeah, for that? That makes sense. Yeah. And then we evaluate, and again, if we want to do further, but if it's you know, a, a, low, a ten-year declining, if we see a big jump in that, we can evaluate and say who's taking advantage of that. Exactly, and that's the key that we can we can revisit this at any time, yeah. absolutely up or down. Would the same formula be sensible in the historic districts, or should that be a different formula? It's largely the same district, did, and I would suggest the same. And that's our recommendation. In, in addition to that, you still have available historic preservation tax credits if you so desire. So, some of this is public education, you know, and people understanding what's available to them and, and actually taking the time to apply for tax it. Tax credits are, are only good for materials. Yes. And, and usually uh, remodeling yes. projects like that are overwhelmingly a lot of labor. Mm -hmm. Or is it, and the other issue, you know, in, in our discussions, is it, is it actually worth it to, you know, to, to make the investment when, when, the, when I'm in, in actuality, I've got to increase my assessed value by so much in order to get that abatement. So if we reduce uh, or increase the ability to get the, to get the abatement is really the goal and then to uh, expand the abatement as well. Which is yes. what Sanchez was talking Combination about. Combination of those two. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. C commercial, 
we're not recommending any changes, really no changes, uh, uh, additional changes that we can make. We're following state code at this point in time. Uh, the only comment I would have is, is if there are additional areas that we should be covering under tax abatement um, than we're currently doing, we could always add additional districts, uh, urban revitalization districts. Uh, and if there's any that uh, uh, you'd like to add, we just need to know that uh, going forward. But we are following state code at this point in time. There's really no changes we can make to the abatement program. What we currently do not have is multifamily residential. Um, those new those uh, const uh, those units are currently or would currently take advantage of the of the housing the new housing credit, which has the five year one hundred percent minimum assessed value one hundred seventy five thousand, and the abatement is on the first seventy five thousand dollars of value. Uh, so, for example, an apartment complex complex. Uh, uh, condos, if, if they meet those minimum, each condo could take advantage of that. An apartment complex, if, if each unit does not, it would take, it'd get the one abatement for a new commercial property. Under state code, you can go up to a 10-year, 100% for multifamily residential. And again, we think it, as a general rule, we're not necessarily uh, ready to, to go up to 10 years and 100%. And there are a number of communities that are, uh, Des Moines, uh, for example, Mount Pleasant, uh, uh, closer to home have 10-year 100% uh, abatements for multifamily residentials and if you've been to Des Moines you, you can certainly see downtown Des Moines is uh, growing in the multifamily residential category. Uh, Mount Pleasant has adopted the 10-year 100% program. I'm talking to our bond council most of the, most of the uh, communities that they've worked with have done something less than the 10-year program. So for example five years 100% as a general rule of thumb for these market rate units. Uh, we'll be talking a little bit different about the, the, the actual quest tonight, but uh, you could go up to, again, 10 years, 100%. We currently just do not have a category for multifamily residential. So one, is there an interest in doing so, and, and at, at what rate? And our suggested rate is the five years, 100%, to kind of start things off and see how it goes. And if we need to bring it back uh, to the maximum, we can certainly bring that back. But some communities, uh, you know, I've just said, we, we want as much multifamily residential as we can get, and we're going to do 10 years at 100%. Well, there is an advantage of multifamily is that you have the need for city services concentrated in one spot rather than, every, you know, one house every five acres or something like that, you know. So I guess there is an advantage to multifamily. 10 years is a long time. Yeah though as well but uh, it, it, you know if our goal is to, to, to grow multifamily residential and, uh, as quickly as possible this you know that uh, may certainly be one route to get there but uh, we currently do not have anything in place beyond the new construction so. Dave do you have a comment yes mayor and council tonight I bet the break, break everything I'm touch we'll start with that I'm just not tall enough but I just want to give you some sense of data uh, we've since 2014 when this program was put into place we've seen about 22 tax abatements come through our office requests that you guys that the City Council has approved has generated about uh, about 8.3 million dollars in a new investment in the community our abatement values that we've abated is about 72,000 it's about 3,000 a year for the number of years that we've agreed to so um, at the end of the at the end of the cycle which I think is currently is it three to five years I can't remember now um, we're no, looking no, at a significant return on the incentivized uh, program we currently have so anything we do tonight or anything we do going forward uh, based off your evaluation will only incent more of the single family or commercial or multifamily developments. Um, so I just happened to have that, uh, that spreadsheet on here and I said, gee, that might be pretty good information to give out uh, for you and to the public to, to be able to weigh into this discussion. Um, Greg's giving you a uh, kind of a 
wide berth of different options in those categories, but those are the three basic categories to, to focus on. And I, I say that it's actually been a real benefit to the community so far. I believe I believe all of those uh, fall under the uh, the uh, the new home category. Yeah. The, the five year one hundred percent minimum assessed value of one hundred seventy five on the first seventy five. I believe all of them fall under that category and, and not not the other categories. That's correct. They're all new homes. Uh, this particular strategy, right. and that's through this summer. Uh, that we do. We've just in, you've just have come up with a new program with with the commercial that hasn't been technically taken advantage of, but that will be, I expect to see some applications pretty soon on that. So are there any thoughts on multifamily residential? Are you willing to uh, look at putting something in place to incent? I mean, certainly um, I'd, I'd like we saw in the housing here. study that, that there is clearly a need. Sure. Um, and, but as uh, far as the uh, level, I guess I'll go with your recommendation at this point. I hadn't really thought about it that much yet, but. Could and you've certainly got time. I mean, we can bring this back, and, and if, if there's some thought to doing something more, um, we can put the, we can begin putting the, the right. Uh, I think your together. recommendation is a good place to start. A five year, five year, hundred percent. Five year, hundred percent would be definitely easy to, yeah. to evaluate and, and be able to get a good return as we start seeing some of those other ones start coming back in. So I think that would be a, a plus. Greg, uh, what's the reasoning that there's a ten percent minimum? Improvement. Well, it, it, maybe it, five. It, it basically could be a nightmare. I mean, if you if you made a hundred dollar improvement and, and you requested a an abatement on a, on a hundred dollar improvement, so you, we're looking for the, for the individual or, or the owner to, to make a minimum investment into their property, uh, and that's on the improve, improvement side, not uh, not on the new construction side. So, in order. In order to uh, to receive the incentive, we're asking that they make a minimum investment into into the uh, into the property. Thank you. All these the value of the improvements, et cetera, is that all based on the assessed value before and after? Yes, and that's the, that's the, yes. We don't we don't control that. So it's really the uh, how much the home's uh, assessed value has increased at the end of the day into the project. So they all have to get their permits and everything prior to and all Absolutely. That. So we can make sure that it's all documented or else that's not going to be able to Absolutely. work. And then as you know, we have uh, three requests for, uh, for incentives. Uh, we have the Muscatine Landing Project, um, Oak Park and Steamboat Loss. And um, in a mixture of of, <laughs> of requests, and and uh, we we've taken a look at this uh, previously um, uh, with the city council, and and uh, have come to some I guess at, at the staff level some some conclusions uh, regarding TIF and tax abatement. The problem is, uh, for example, Muscatine uh, Landing is currently in a TIF district. Oak Park is is currently not in a TIF. Uh, district or an urban revitalization area. Uh, Steamboat Loss is currently in a tax abatement uh, area, and uh, so to carve out a carve out a TIF uh, for that area, uh, it, it's certainly possible. Um, it, the the five years 100% is is not the request, however, that we talked about for multifamily residential. It's the 10-year 100%. Uh, they each so they each come with their own their own quirks and, and requests, uh, and again each. Are asking for tax credits, and, and um, uh, some are asking for Section 8. Uh, you know, one is a market rate unit that's asking for five years at 100%. Um, and Mr. Yeager couldn't be here tonight, and I put an email on your on your desk from Mr. Yeager um, as well. Chris Ailes and On Hume uh, are here tonight for um, uh, for for the other two projects as well, and so. A couple thoughts uh, that we put together, and just some very brief notes at the bottom of the page there regarding TIF and tax abatement. Tax abatement is very easy. It's a simple process. It's an application. If you qualify, you meet the minimum criteria. It goes on the consent agenda. The council approves the consent agenda, and you're off and running. It's a very simple process. Tax increment financing. Uh, this is, of course, after the program is in place. The urban revitalization district or area is, is, is created. Then the program is put in place. 
uh, for tax increment financing, of course, it has to be in an urban renewal area. You have to create a TIF district. Once that is done, you have to create an individual agreement each time you, you, uh, you have a, a request for tax increment financing. However, with tax increment financing comes our ability to require uh, uh, additional uh, improvements uh, or, or other items as well as we've done in the past. Uh, commercial uh, and industrial projects, uh, we often require uh, or uh, request um, information related to jobs. Uh, commercial projects, we've often requested uh, that public infrastructure be uh, put in place. So with the TIF agreement, uh, we have a little bit more flexibility to require additional things. We've noted a couple of those down there as well. Ability to mandate or, or include uh, in the rebate improvements, aesthetics, uh, parks, trails, green space, and other amenities as well. Uh, that's just, those are issues that have also come up recently in, in, in with one of the projects as well. So we have more f flexibility to, to mandate or require or to uh, address public infrastructure needs with tax increment financing. So both programs are, are good and I think we should have both from programs available within the city. The question is how do we tailor it to these individual projects given their individual quirks? Um, I think I'll start at the top um, with the gentleman that, that, that's not here. And what, what we're looking for is consensus to, to bring forward uh, letters of recommend, excuse me, letters uh, for council action at, at uh, next week's meeting. Uh, so I'm gonna start with Muscatine Landing. They're requesting tax, uh, excuse me, tax abatement. Um, and you'll see in their, their letter that, that that's their preference. However, they're in the middle of a tax increment financing district. Um, other phases they've talked about in, include commercial projects. Uh, the second phase of their housing uh, project includes a large sewer, uh, and TIF is more suited uh, for, for dealing with, with those issues and, and that public infrastructure uh, than tax abatement is from our perspective at, at the staff level. Uh, you, can, you can tailor tax agreement financing based on the assessed value to come and to mirror pretty much what tax abatement does. I mean, so you, you've got some flexibility. You can create a minimum assessed value um, that, that, that gets them uh, close to where they need. Now, at, in talking to Mr. Yeager today, their current estimate, uh, th they believe their value is going to be much higher, probably close to $11 million. So these, these numbers that you see before you are really rough estimates at, the, at this point in time. But the, can can we get in a tax abatement in a TIF district? I didn't think you could do that. You you can overlap, and we do have uh, in, in the South End, for example, an area where we have the small business forgivable loan overlapping the tax abatement uh, uh, area uh, as in the South End TIF district. But but you can't give both TIF and tax abatement benefits to Correct. the same development. Correct. It could be in the same area. So that it, and I look at this and I see. The difference between Muscatine Landing and the other two projects listed here is that it is it's it's a multi-use type project. It is commercial, not just residential. And what I recall of the of the uh, presentation the last time is a, a big emphasis was to find a way to pay for the infrastructure improvement, specifically the sewer line. And is is that accurate? And that's for the next phase. In this initial phase, phase, there is a street. Uh, public street that would that would be included as well. The other problem with tax abatement is that you can't include tax abatement for a single parcel. It has to be on multiple parcels or you will not be able to create that urban revitalization area. Uh, you have to have multiple parcels in order to do that. So that, that creates an issue um, in this area as well. Yeah, and isn't tax abatement outside of the city like, you know, levy limits and... I'm sorry? Can't be added later? Well, if, I, I, it, if it's a TIF, if it's a TIF benefit, and we do it subject to annual appropriation, it does not affect our debt limit. The question is, how does tax abatement, if at all, affect our debt limit? Does it figure into the computation? I don't think it does, but no. so well, I mean, we, we, we can construct risk, either one to, to meet our mm -hmm. needs in terms of our own. Yeah, the issuer assumes the risk if we start doing that. It affects our the, bonded, bonding. Which is why we do annual appropriation. So it's simply the rebate rather than the entire amount. So if you remember the mall TIF, 
was done at a time when the city had not started doing annual appropriations. So we had to include the entire five or six million dollars against our debt limit rather than the annual payment, which was, I believe at the time, somewhere less than $40,000. Uh, so rather than accounting $40,000 against our debt limit, we had to count $5,000 annually against our debt five limits. Million. And five million, excuse me. And, and uh, we were able to work that out so that we no longer have to do that. Uh, so yeah. uh, those are some of the issues with, with this particular project. Yeah, the, the annual appropriation makes perfect sense for the for the TIF benefit. There. We, we have not done one without it yeah. in recent years. Right. right. I, uh, my well, question was, does abatement affect our debt limit? And the answer is no. Um, I do like the idea in, in the case of Muscatine Landing of being able to control some of or, or have more influence over some of the infrastructure improvements simply because it is mixed use development as opposed to being just residential. Although, just to be clear, this first project is simply residential. I understand. Okay. Understand. If it ends up TIF, is that's not that's not going to dissuade them from. They prefer tax tax abatement, um, but I think we can cr I think we can uh, I think we can uh, formulate a, a tax a tax increment financing plan that can get us to the same or close to the same end result. Yeah. I would In my prefer, opinion, I would prefer TIF on this. And he says they work with it. What's yeah. that? Uh, I would prefer TIF on this. Yeah. Because, I mean, you're not going to be able to, especially if it's just on a, one parcel, like you mentioned earlier, too. The, uh, the next uh, project that we had down was Oak Park, and um, uh, Chris Ailes is here tonight, and uh, I believe we're on the same page on, on this project. Uh, the request was, was 15 years at 70 percent, and um, we believe the numbers are relatively close uh, regarding this project as well. And and this uh, this area is in not is not is in neither a tax abatement nor TIF district, and uh, so we'll have to uh, amend the urban renewal plan uh, if uh, we proceed with the tax increment financing. Uh, however. They will be looking for a letter of support for tax increment financing in, in roughly a 15-year, 70% uh, uh, program. If you recall, Miller Valentine received tax increment financing last uh, last year. Well, I believe it was last year, uh, in the amount of uh, 15 years, 75% for the first five years, 70% for the for the remaining 10 years. So it's a similar request uh, to the to the uh, Har Harrison Lofts uh, project. So with that, uh, any questions, comments, discussion, or Mr. Ailes is here tonight as well? Greg, uh, at this time, have we uh, approved the uh, change of, of the zoning? No, you're still working through that process. This is a separate and distinct process. This is uh, related, the letter of support is related to their application for tax credits. Uh, and we have a whole separate process that we'll have to uh, enact, uh, the, or the council will have to enact uh, to enable tax increment financing. We'll have to include it in the urban <coughs> plan. Then we'll have to prepare a, 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 a create a tax uh, increment financing district, and then we'll have to prepare a tax increment financing agreement. When do you foresee uh, an answer to the petition? I believe for the tax credits. Correct. I believe that was March, March. Yeah. of 2018. So irregardless, it probably makes sense to move forward to at least include this area uh, and provide uh, incentives. And, and as you'll note in the map that Andy pro provided, uh, he, he suggested a larger area uh, or tract uh, that we could uh, for future development as well. So is there any objection to proceeding in, in that? Mr. Ellis, did you want to bring up your? Any? Do you have any comments? Chris Ailes, excuse me, um, from Davenport. I, I don't have anything to add. I think we've all talked about the project uh, in depth in the past at the uh, the P and Z meeting and the city council meeting regarding the zoning. But I'd be happy to answer any specific questions you have of me. If not, I appreciate your help. Thank you. Thanks. And then the third project uh, and request was Steamboat Lofts. Uh, 
Um, if you recall, Steamboat Loss is uh, directly off of Diana Queen Drive. It is currently in a tax abatement district. And um, their request is for a 10-year, 100% tax abatement. This is where it gets a little complicated. Uh, what we discussed earlier was providing for a, for a uh, five-year, 100% uh, program. Now, um, uh, I apologize. Is it Mr. Mr. On or Mr. Hume? Mr. On, um, I, I don't know that it uh, matters as long as, uh, as the in dollar amount uh, gets us from point A to point B. So we could create a TIF district uh, if that is the council's preference rather than uh, creating a 10 year 100% uh, uh, tax abatement program in this district because it would not simply apply to, to this project, it would apply to the entire urban revitalization area. So our suggestion in this case would be to overlap tax increment financing and tax abatement and come up with a, a program that's a, uh, a TIF program that roughly equates to what they would receive for that 10-year 100% uh, abatement. But if we, if we adopt that for this project, it's already an exception to the, to the code that we discussed earlier. Because we, earlier we talked about a multifamily residential. Correct five years for 100 percent and we're already at 10 years well with all three projects uh or all four projects if you include uh last year's harrison loss harrison loss was 15 years at 70 percent yeah. now i think there's there are there are distinctions with these projects all four all excuse me three of those four projects are tax credit projects right. that are looking uh for state support so i think you can justify the additional requirement to meet uh the state application requirements uh, and um, there are, uh, there, so, so I don't remember if there are public infrastructure in, in some of those component pieces as well. There are stormwater issues um, that, that came up uh, at previous discussions as well. So, so if we're going to do that, should we, should we codify the, what I call the exception in the event that it's a tax credit project? We have a different set of rules than for anything else? We can include that in the TIF agreement. So why are, why are we not consistent then on the TIF then from Oak Park to Steam Lofts? Percentage wise. That's what the uh, request was um, to City Council and this. And if, if uh, in Mr. Uh, in in uh, the case of Steamboat Loss, it's really the, the, the amount that was the critical but, uh, so if we, we can do the same thing with tax increment financing, I don't think there's an objection to proceeding along those lines. So it will not look like, it will not be 10 years at 100%, it will be something different. We'll have to, we'll have to figure out exactly what that, it, what you're saying, the is. dollars would be somewhat equivalent. They're after a specific number. It used to be when you apply, applied for tax credits, these things got sent to the state to IFA and they were scored. Well, they really don't score them anymore, but there is a target debt service coverage ratio and you need to back into it. So this is the number they need to hit that debt service coverage ratio to qualify that for the tax credit. It, it will, it's- Does it's, that make sense to you? It's, no. it's gonna be it's very- complicated, yeah. it's, it's gonna be very close to the 15 years, 70% at the Dollar end of the day. Wise. In order to, to receive those dollars. Right. And it's again, based on the assessed value. <clears throat> it will look much the same for both projects. So yes, that, that is the issue. There, we, there is a distinction, and is tax credits the distinction in, in order to receive a, a higher benefit? Yes. Uh, is it tax credits, or perhaps it's a state application? Um, we provided uh, IADA assistance for other projects as well, commercial uh, or in projects as well. So perhaps applications for state and federal funding uh, receive additional consideration rather than a simple uh, tax abatement market rate program. Steamboat lofts, either I'm missing something or have we seen those plans? Have we even seen those? Yes. We did? Uh, they were uh, at, at the same project okay. as Mr. Ailes? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't remember seeing like a detailed it, drawing. The, the packets is, the, is still online and you can certainly okay. pull up all, all of the details. Um, but if you recall, um, this is the same firm that, that is the Miller Valentine that's doing the Harrison Loft project off of uh, Harrison and Van Dyke Drive. Okay. It's coming along, looks like. Coming along, yes, very well. 
So I'm, I'm, I'm more um, open to making the Steamboat Lofts a, uh, a TIF district then, than making it a tax abatement. But I do recommend what you mentioned earlier in regards to not overlapping that. Mm -hmm. And then that would help incentivize more homes in those areas as well too. I don't know if you need a consensus on that and from everyone or not. So that that district, what, when when tax abatement is created, will already have in place a five-year, 100% program per our discussion today. If, if if that proceeds, that somebody could take advantage of in that in that area, uh, if they wanted something more, they were applying for tax credits. They could come back to city council and ask for something, something uh, individualized. Do you have any questions for any of the uh, developers? Or do you have any anything you'd like to bring up for council? I think that's it in a nutshell. Okay. <laughs> in, in a nutshell. So I I'm good with staff's recommendations on approving all of them. As far as my my opinion goes, and also an agreement of making sure that they're all TIF district or TIF versus tax abatements as well too. Any objections Good. to moving forward? No, not at all. The, the maps are in there tonight. Uh, I don't know that we need to go through those, but uh, you, you'll see oh, some additional areas. The audience can't see the maps. They're, on, they're online. Uh, I did encourage you to take a look at those uh, and um, and also to consider if there are districts that sh that uh, new districts that we should consider uh, creating um, in in Muscatine where it would be appropriate to incent uh, through tax abatement. Um, uh, that are currently not covered by tax abatement um, as well. So we'll be bringing those forward as well. Uh, there's a couple in here. Just to, just to briefly mention, for example, uh, where, um, I can't think of the name of the road, but uh, where Palms Drive ends uh, and that continues on down, um, that would be a proposed new tax abatement area to incent development inside the city limits in, in that area as well. So you'll see those in the maps. I could encourage you to take a look at those. That, those would come forward at the same time. But if you have any ideas for other areas, please let us know. That brings us to Chief Evers is going to talk about fireworks. Are you? Well, sir. Or who's going to start? I'll, I'll start. Uh, start. Brett and, uh, and uh, uh, Chief Talking and Chief. And you too, uh, Brett. Chief Evers and Chief Talkington are both here tonight to answer any questions you might have on the stats that they provided. But just in, in a nutshell, in your packet, you have uh, statistics from both police and fire from uh, from around in and around the 4th of July, although fireworks in, were just going off in my neighborhood last week, uh, as a side note. Um, you have our original memo uh, included in the packet, uh, staff uh, summaries. And those are summaries from uh, area fire departments uh, and a list of some of the uh, changes that have uh, either already occurred or in process or consi under consideration. Uh, uh, Jerry received those from other fire departments in and around um, uh, the state of Iowa. You also have some information provided from the University of Iowa uh, related to injuries and fireworks. And um, just as a uh, quick side note, uh, again, staff's recommendation uh, going forward for council consideration and, and um, uh, we're certainly not asking council to take action tonight um, but uh, to answer any, we're here to answer any questions uh, you might have if there's more information you'd like to, to bring forward uh, our recommendation is similar to our original recommendation and uh, however uh, we are recommending that we keep uh, the sale of fireworks uh, as it is uh, was currently adopted by city council, but we are recommending uh, that uh, use be banned in the city limits. That what? Use be banned in the city limits. Okay. That is our, our recommendation. Um, use of fireworks, all fireworks. Yes. Every day. 
I do have a question. And in, in lieu, if, if council does not want to consider a ban on the use of fireworks, our recommendation, much like many of the other uh, cities in your packet, would be to very narrowly uh, define the days that can be used or to shorten their use to one or two days, which be, seems to be the, the other alternative. Uh, most communities are either banning or, or, or severely restricting the days to one or two days. So in lieu of, of a ban, our recommendation would be shorten it to one or two days. And most of the, the examples you have here are exactly that. They, they restrict the time you can use them. But Storm Lake has a different approach or slightly different. They identify class one and class two fireworks and saying that they're, they're currently adopting an ordinance that would only allow class two. So I don't know what the difference is. How would the resident distinguish? How would the fireworks person distinguish which one they're buying or whatever? <clears throat> it would be listed on uh, the the box itself, whether it was the class one or the class two. Okay. So, and, and we can give you additional information. There's all the. I think we probably gave it to you initially. Uh, prior to all this of uh, the sure. different classifications of what was legal before what's legal afterwards and they kind of break it down but basically it's the smaller stuff first the great big commercial uh, the great big mortars sure. that, those are the different ones that are definitely more dangerous but can we restrict the sales of those we could you can you can restrict the sales of class one or class two I believe you can really I thought you couldn't I didn't I mean, think we, there we, were any we, 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 we sales it's uh, it's in the NFPA section, and, and again, we would have to we would have to dig back through the documents, but we can get you more information on that. Okay, and then there was a reference in here to somebody over near Des Moines. They're they're in the middle of a court case. Yeah, because yes. they banned the the sale of it. They, well, you can't ban the sale. Well, well they did. They, well, they did it by, <laughs> well, by they zoning. They did it through case. zoning. That's right. So that would have been very similar to our original recommendation right. to keep it in industrial zones and to provide right. for a variance through the ZBA. Yeah. Okay. But then they got sued by a vendor. Jeez, yeah, that would have been that would have been Johnston. Yeah. This year, compared to last year, that there's been a sizable number of uh, of injuries. Yes. Yes, if you looked at the information that the University of Iowa provided, uh, we just got that information just a couple days ago. Uh, the injuries were more severe than before, and the injuries have doubled than what they were in the previous three years. Hmm. So, you know, that's information. All of our uh, patients go to the University of Iowa. They're the number one trauma center for burns. And their document <laughs> documentation, if you look at the graphs, they would average about 10 um, burn patients a year related to fireworks injuries. Uh, this year, after they're legalized, uh, they had 21. So you can see the graph. You see the previous years are at 10, 10, 10, and then they jumped to 21. And then they also said that the, the burns and the treatments and the surgeries required to it uh, were more severe than, they, what, than what they were before. Uh, one, of the, one of the fire department stats that weren't included in the packets, I know the police department, they included uh, all their um, stats uh, involved, uh, what came through the dispatch center and what they dealt with. Uh, our, our stats related to fire and EMS in the hospital was not listed, but I can tell you that uh, uh, for the fire department, we had four uh, fire-related calls. One was a trash and a rubbish fire, uh, two were uh, smoke uh, calls, and one was a structure fire. We personally had zero EMS calls, uh, but the people that were injured here in Muscatine either did not seek treatment or they drove themselves to the hospital. <coughs> uh, the hospital had uh, three burn injuries, and two of the burn injuries went by helicopter to, to the University Thank of Iowa. I, was that, I would see with that. Okay. Who came, okay. He came in to uh, ER? It's a very, very serious situation. Yeah. 
they, they are very dangerous and you know the recommendation is to leave it to the professionals but kind of like what, what Greg <laughs> said is we kind of wanted to stick with our original recommendation of banning the discharge altogether. If that's not an option, it would definitely I think be better for everybody if you could shorten the time frame down on the window. Like right now, it's at eight days in the summertime and it's at nine days that they're allowed to discharge them uh, over kind of Christmas and the New Year's. And so if you can kind of shorten that time frame down on the discharging, that would be easier on us. And at least for the fire department, the majority of the work really falls <laughs> on the fire marshal, Mike Hartman, that has to deal with all of it. But really, the majority of it really all falls. Once, once this gets uh, legal and legalized and they know what we have to do, all the enforcement issue falls on the police department. Sure. So the shorter the window that we have, it's going to be easier for them to deal with. And without Brett having to get up there, there were a lot of police calls. And you probably know Jerry so about how many. I'm sure Brett would love to get up there. So if, if we, <laughs> and, and, and I don't know the answer to this question, but if we're to change code and say and take the staff's recommendation and make them illegal, do we believe those numbers are going down? I mean, how do you legislate good behavior? You don't. Yeah. yeah that's my concern. We're going to deal with them either way. Exactly. So it would oh. be even worse. I would believe because now they know they're illegal, so more people are going to be making those phone calls. I don't know. I bet those numbers would even go. I mean, more. the stats pretty well I speak mean, for themselves. When, so when, when we when we, we were chasing the, our tails with them. Yeah. yeah. When, when we made the recommendation before the eight days, it was because the initial presentation to us was giving us at six weeks, and I personally thought that was way too much. I would. And, and the only thought for me was thinking that we've had that for the last forty years. I've always heard them going off sure. and, and constantly hearing those go off for about a week before right I after after going through the 4th of July myself and seeing how much it was personally I thought this is man did I create this monster in my mind because it was so much so much to the point where I didn't even want to go to the 4th of July because I just thought I've already think I've heard enough fireworks I feel a recommendation of minimizing it personally to two days, similar to what I saw in that Bettendorf's um, presentation, um, and is basically saying the third and the fourth, and then potentially just even minimizing the time. If we can come up with a system that's similar to what Tom said as far as classifying either as a one and a two, so they're either something small versus it being these huge mortars, I don't know if we can restrict the sales. I am I'm extremely <coughs> challenged with the thought process of saying how can we continue to sell them for six weeks, but yet don't use them. That's not gonna happen. It's just not gonna happen. So I would feel more recommendation of saying, okay, here's the time limit, here's the, you know, either two to 11, is similar to what I saw in the Bettendorf plan, and saying, and this is the time we're gonna do them, and this is the two days you're gonna be allowed to do them. And then you still can utilize them, but I don't feel we can completely ban them until legislature changes something that says, okay, you can't restrict the sale. And certainly hoping that the novelty wear, will wear off. I mean, we haven't had fireworks legal here for Right. I think another year time. is going to be a telling tale as to how it goes. So, But if you don't want to ban them altogether, I, I'd recommend one or two days I'm as well. I'm just giving you my, my personal view. Now, again, this is just you're asking for our opinion. That's my opinion. If somebody else has said that they can go <coughs> to ban them and I'm out, outgunned, I'm fine. That doesn't bother me. I'm just giving you my personal opinion. Yes. Of so we either need a, a consensus to move forward, or if you want us, if you want us to bring this back at a date after you've had more time to consider it, we just need to know how you'd like to proceed at, at the end of the night. Personally, I, I'd like to see just one day, not even two. But I did. I had a call from a, a lady today, and she's mm -hmm. not, uh, has some health problems today, or she would have been here herself. But she went even further, and she said, if you're going to shoot them off, even on one day have them down at the riverfront or something so it's it's there isn't so much property damage and stuff like that i just told i don't know if rich would go for that though what i don't know if rich would go for that though i really have had calls on both sides and i'm sure most of you have as well a lot of people think you know what we're responsible we we do it during the time frame. We should still be able to do that with our families right. in our backyard safely. And then you have the other people who don't. The like ones that. that we deal with. Yes. Yeah. And I, and the ones that rattle your windows are the ones that are quite annoying. 
especially when they're off for yeah. 12 hours in a row. Chief, I'm, I, I'm, I'm still in favor of banning them completely. I'd be in favor of that as well. If one child gets hurt, it's our fault. It's not the parents because we have a ordinance out there letting them to, to do it. Well, like I say, whatever you guys choose to do, we're still going to deal with them. And it is an enforcement issue. And it makes it tough for us to enforce it because a lot of the calls that we go to, we can't prove who's setting them off. So, which is why you we only see 11 arrests this year, which is way up compared to 2016. It was a 266% increase. But if we could have proved that there was who was doing it or who was shooting them off, we would have had a lot more. But we also are in a um, educational phase this first year too with it. So there were a lot of warnings as well. Although we can deal with the property owner if we if we can right. identify the property, we can deal with the property owner, not necessarily the individual setting them off. So. And the problem is a lot of people don't like to get involved being a witness because yes. they don't want to go to court. Two hundred and sixty-six so. calls. That's a lot of calls. Yeah, that's a lot of calls. Our guys weren't real happy that a couple of weeks. One location uh, donated their. Is it under fire code? Hy-Vee. Hy I believe it was Hy-Vee. Just the fire work. Should be. I think if anybody wants to do that. The fire regulations, yeah. is that what it is? Okay. But you're supposed to keep it at that location. <coughs> anybody I, else? I believe we have one, in? one entity in town that, that, that uh, allowed volunteers here, to, yeah. to donate, uh, uh, to run the operation and donate the proceeds. Yeah. One thing I'm conflicted with is Part of me doesn't want to ban the fireworks, but part of me is concerned with when they set off aerial rockets, there's no control about where they go or where they come down. And I also had reports from citizens that say the neighbors were shooting them off from the streets. And I suppose you, I think the city had a lot of instances where they, there was fireworks all over the streets in various places. And, and that certainly would, was against the law. It would be illegal to shoot them off in the street. Not, you cannot set them off on city property. Mm -hmm. That's not unlike any other year, though. Right. We just dealt with them a lot more, obviously, because they're legal to sell in Iowa now. Had one which, in my opinion, was a poor decision by the state. One lady who called me lived on a dead end street, and she said, of course, at the dead end, it was just a massive fireworks displays. Right. Mm -hmm. I'd be in favor, I guess, of restricting the time, the days. Uh, and maybe the class. Short of banning them. You know. And then knock down the cannons. But you, if you look at how Bettendorf plan sets up, it seems pretty uh, <coughs> similar to what I'm, I'm looking at. So if you look at what I'm saying, though, that was, that's the, the same system of similar to what Bettendorf had in the two days. Third and the fourth, two thirty-first and the first. Two to something. I don't know what the time says, but it says right there. And I'd be good with that too. And and you know you have a time restriction. You know you have a two-day restriction. You By know time, you're still hours of the day. You yeah. Yeah. Give us time to do the educational piece too. Yeah. You know through social media, what the changes were and stuff like that. I, and then the responsible people, can use people will do it during that time, and the people that are going to break the law are going to break it anyway. But at least you give an opportunity for those. Do you two have an opinion on the class that Tom mentioned? I mean, is, is that a big difference? To, to me, it's not a big difference. Okay. So, you know, again, if they're going to shoot them off, they're going to shoot them off. I mean, it's more of either uh, don't let them shoot them off or let them shoot them off. But the idea is that if you're going to let them shoot them off, shorten the time frame down. So, so I'm not too worried about the two types of classes. Uh, I meant okay. like the I'll degree of the again. hazard, the, the fire hazard, the injury hazard, or. No. No, because the small ones can injure you just okay. like the big ones. Okay. Except the, so those those class ones are awfully loud. <laughs> I'd be so, in favor of either zero or one day in July. Hurt bad or getting hurt what, really, what really bad. What's the distribution of They're Christmas and New Year's? I understand that, but I mean, turn, talk about irritating the uh, neighbors. A small yeah. noise is better than a big noise. Right. <laughs> I'll get you more. Are you with the yeah. Christmas and New Year tradition? Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's what we have because that's they're still allowing the, the sale of them during that time. He's saying he's never heard of people doing it on those days. Oh, no, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with not, but I, I, it was part of the sale thing, yeah. so I'm, I'm over here thinking 
Maybe we just give them a day, but He's I don't saying, know too have many you ever people. Heard of people shooting? No, no, I I normally do not hear them. I'm not out there on New Year's Eve trying to light a firework in the uh, middle of. There are a know. few. I mean, it's but it's well. We'll see what happens That's this yeah, year. It's, um, As it's written, they're it's get, they get one extra day in the winter time than they do in the summertime because it's it's only eight days as of right now in the summer. <laughs> they get nine days in the winter. So, so I propose I propose maybe not to just one day too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I have no problem with that. Just one day, not even two days. Give them from, like what? It, well, give New Year's Eve. It says it basically went from like I think it said from two o'clock to like twelve thirty or something like that, which basically would give you two days. New Year's Eve. Right. Mm-hmm. It was New Year's Eve. Yeah, at past the New Year's Eve as they celebrate. So if I've heard correctly, more information on class one versus class two, two days for July uh, 4th and one day, day, day and time frame, two days for July and one day for um, yeah. New Year's. New Year's. That's, that, lot, that's Yeah, that's my... And I, we can I bring that work. back in the form of a draft ordinance for consideration. Sure. Yeah, it's so, and then as if legislature changes, then I'm willing to... to on the sale that again too because obviously you know i i don't believe we're going to be able to restrict that at all so you cannot sit here and have me believe that we're going to be able to sell it and they're not going to use it i know that there's people that don't want to completely ban but then they're never going to stop Uh, we'll see our numbers double in calls Comments from council. Councilman Spread, do you have anything to know? Oh, I'm sorry. Did you need something? The fireworks? Please come up. It's okay. There you go. You got more muscles than I do. <laughs> um, I, I concur with what Greg mentioned but banning them entirely I see the issue of the sale of them as being separate but the main thing I wanted to call to the attention I get, I'll just refer you back to my last time I, I was here I'm the lady that was sick I just figured that out <laughs> and I just uh, it was been a long night <laughs> uh, I've thought about this in, in many different ways I've talked to you about the impact on people personally of all socioeconomic levels of all age age groups and and uh, I'm going to talk to you mainly about my age group and and I have a husband who was in the hospital and at Lutheran living during this time I was glad because I, that was a safety place for me to go because it made me very nervous to have all this noise going on and, and I talked to you about the impact on pets and on pe- two people came and ta- here, which means there are many more about property damage. I talked to you about the type of people. You, you really don't want this around hospitals and care centers. But what I, what I thought about, I said, well, I'm a hospital. I'm a care center. My husband has very serious disease. We have in-home nursing in our home. He has special needs. And, and to have that in our, in our neighborhood, or you can hear it from many, many distances, is very disruptive to our health and to our safety. So there, and then you have people with post-traumatic stress disorder, you have infants in the beds, you have elderly people dealing with early stages of dementia and sundowners. Uh, you have people who sleep at different shifts and, and uh, uh, and it impacts their life and their health. That's kind of a summary of it. But let me tell you about, I thought about this and I thought, what should we as a city be considering? The general welfare and protection of people in the citizens of Muscatine. And it seems to me, and maybe I'm minimizing it, but I don't think so the entertainment of others. You do have a complication in the fact that you can sell and look what are you gonna do with them. I'd rather deal with having, having it banned completely in the city and deal with the people who can't choose not to comply. 
I think giving them other places to go, whichever one the city would deem safe and, and appropriate and away from the general population. We have Des Moines and we have um, Iowa City who banned it completely, which probably would have been a good idea because we don't have the presence of people doing that. So I'm just going, that's, I, and I was glad to hear about the injuries because that's what I had heard also. The city has a wonderful 4th of July. It's excellent. It has the parade, it has the river act activities, it has the concert, and it has the fireworks. If there's any more money to be spent, that would be the area that I think would be the best, and that would be what I would recommend. In summary, it's very hard for me, and I know there are many homes in the same situation. Whether it's for two nights from those extended hours, to listen to that when you're on lots of meds and your mind isn't functioning correctly and your heart is not, your body isn't, to expose those very vulnerable and in need population. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Mosh. Can I get your Go name? Ahead, Fran. name? Jean Mosh. Oh, yeah, G Jean Mosh, 1816 Duncan Drive. Thank you, Council and Mayor. Thank you. My name's Jeff Osborne, 970 Lucas Street. Uh, I didn't intend to get up here and talk about fireworks. I don't really have a dog in this race at all, but I do want to share experience I've had in the limiting in Missouri and Arkansas where it's legal to buy those things year round. Um, and, uh, and and I think there's some contention around, well, the state's you know making us sell them, year round, sell them, but you know, what do we do about it? And in those states, especially Missouri, uh, after, I would imagine, you know, with the maturity there, there's been several years of it. It's just not as crazy as it was here. And I lived in St. Louis where you can distinctly hear 9 millimeter go off on 4th of July very quickly all the time. And that, that makes you duck. But <laughs> this was as crazy as I've ever seen it in the last year in my experience. But, here, but here's my point. They sell them year-round down there. Uh, they ban it in the city limits just about everywhere I've lived. And that, that I think, brings some sanity to the equation. Allowing one day would be generous, in my opinion. Maybe a good place to start, but you know, if that doesn't work, take that away too. I don't think it's that big a deal to be able to buy, and like I said, they bought, they would, we could buy fireworks year round down in Missouri, and they were never allowed in any of the city limits that I, that I ever lived in, and, and it really wasn't that bad. Sure, they went off, yeah, it went, you know, just like, probably have before here illegally as well, but this last year was nuts, <laughs> so. Thank you, Mr. Osborne. Hello, Mayor and City Council. My name is Roger Chapman. I live at 1012 East 8th Street here in Muscatine, and I want to echo on Mrs. Moss's you know, sentiment on the fireworks. You know, my wife has serious health issues. She's had several strokes over the years. Her brain is not functioning like it normally did. When the fireworks went off this year, I mean, she was just ballistic. It was all she could do to handle the noise because of the, the impact on her head. I mean, it's just crazy. You know, my neighbors just got carried away with them, something awful. They were shooting mortars off the roof, had neighbors firing bottle rockets across the drive at the, the Circle K gas station while people were pumping gas. I mean, how stupid is that? That's agreed, just, agreed. But I'm going to ask you the same question I asked the police chief and the fire chief. How do we legislate good behavior? How do we get there? And I, it, ban it in the city limits completely. I, Send them out in the country somewhere where they can that, shoot them off and not bother That doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. It's going to happen, problem. I know, because there's too many ignorant people yeah. out there that don't like to comply with the law. But exactly. They need to do something. I mean, I'm sure, just like Santos said, shorten it to one or two days. It's not going to help. They're still going to do it. They had a time frame this year, and they was it, doing it so before I mean, the time frame ever started. And I think if, if we end up having more issues and more problems within the reducing it down to the one to two days it also allows the other side of the, the, the coin where other families that said hey we're doing everything fine we're doing everything right the state allows the sale what can we do you know how come you're taking it away from normal families that are working and trying to celebrate the, the fourth of july and our independence mm -hmm. so you you have to find a balance on both of those i understand where you're coming from 
we have two or three potential bad, you know, apples, and I hope that the that the police and, and fire can address those. But I hope that this was just kind of a, a new thing, and we don't run into that. If we do, then we'll we'll regroup. I mean, what we what we're putting in does not <coughs> say that it's it's etched in stone that this will never change. If it turns out we end up having a lot of issues, we can come back, and I'm more than open to saying let's completely either remove it and hope that we can have legislature change in the restrictions, but it's it's a difficult balance to try to make that work. Yeah, I can understand that, but like I said, you know, they need to do something. I, I understand. I Roger. don't want to go through Christmas and New Year's like we did the Fourth of July. No, I mean, we're not. We're not. Nuts. We're not in. We're not. I'm not looking forward to another round of that. that. In your personal preference is a ban. Correct? Yes, ban them within the city limits. Let them go out in the country. And there's all kinds of open areas out in the country where they can shoot those things off. Who are they going to bother? There's nobody around. Except the guy that lives there. <laughs> Send him down Deep Lakes Park. <laughs> Thank you, Roger. Thank you. Councilman Spread, did you have anything to add tonight? <coughs> Nothing at this time. <coughs> Councilman Raywalt? Yeah, one thing, on the, in the September 7th meeting, I requested the uh, city start inspecting the White Way Hotel for code violations. I imagine they'll be out there tomorrow. Oh, well, that's next week. Thank you, sir. Councilman Saucedo. Um, I had a discussion last uh, couple weeks in regards to going down and um, reviewing the parking concerns with the downtown. I would like to see if we could review that again and put that on the agenda to look at the Second Street parking and potential avenues for discussion and making a uh, trial until the construction's done with addressing that and then we maybe review that again well there were there were several alternatives which one would you like us to consider i was interested in the three hour for the entire block potentials i knew that they'd had a couple different options but i do want to i do want to make an emphasis that we look at this and then also know that we address that after all the construction's done again and review it if we believe review. that that is not a problem as much. I don't want to say that what we do as a recommendation if we were to make a change is set in stone for the next 10 years. Council can always change the city code. But I know I need to have a consensus of on that. Would there be more that would be interested in reviewing that? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. You got four. There you go. Thank you. Councilman Natvig. Uh, just a quick thank you to Fire and Police for putting on the public safety, uh, whatever you call it, guys. Open, Open house. house. Open house. That's all. Thank you. Councilman Harvey. Nothing except I just remind uh, citizens that I think Saturday will be the last, second Saturday in the downtown area. So it's your last chance to partake. Councilman Bynum. Nothing tonight, Your Honor. Staff. A quick clarification on the parking. Was that next week or at, at the end of? The next end of? Or next week? I would like to see if we could see it next week. So draft, draft, the draft ordinance. Yes. yes. Okay. But again, making the, the... Three hours versus two hours. Correct. But also looking at the saying that, okay, after construction is done, we can I, come back and review this. I don't think you can I, write that into code. Yeah. I, I, you know, we can change code at any time. We, we pass the ordinance with the understanding that we're going to review it. But I don't, right. I don't think you can put a deadline into code. Right. If we can't, that's yeah. fine. There are things where we can do a trial Putting period. Putting it in our minutes now that we're right. doing that so yeah, then we so can say that we're, we have that archive to go back in and say, okay, one year from now, six months from now, whatever it is. And I just had a couple of things. I wanted to, again, thank the League of Women Voters for the wonderful event they did for the candidate forum. They always do such a nice job for the community to keep them informed. Secondly, I'd like to remind everyone that Discovery Center is having their annual Halloween hike on Saturday, 6.30 to 8.30. And lastly, I would just like to remind everyone that the second annual uh, Memories Start With Us walk to benefit Alzheimer's is going to be happening also at Discovery Park from 10 to 12. 
on Saturday. So lots of things going on on Saturday. And Your Honor? Yes. I apologize, one, one last item. Mm -hmm. We just wanted to um, announce and uh, congratulate some folks. Uh, the city received uh, a, the, well, was, was awarded the uh, CAT grant at yesterday's meeting that was attended by uh, City Planner Andrew Fangman, Rich Dwyer from Kent Corp, Gary Carlson, and Greg Jenkins, um, our co-chairs for the CIAT. Uh, and uh, that is uh, contingent upon the remaining funding of roughly $200,000 being raised by November 30th. I'm sure we're going to get there. Um, and that will, um, uh, that would bring all four projects forward as part of the, part of the CAN grant. So we want to thank the volunteers at the CIAT. Andrew's hard work in putting the application together and the committee in reviewing that. Uh, great work by everybody involved. And um, uh, so great news for the city of Muscatine. You remind us of? $210,000? And those four $210, projects $210, are? Well, the grant is for $500,000. Yeah. Ah. Huh? Grant, okay. Yeah, but it's $9 Cabins at Deep Cabins, Lake Park, the trail, trail system, yeah. the dog park. Library. The library being redone, yes. All good things. Nine Deep Lake's cabin. Thank you, Your Honor. Yes. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Good night. I got a